Professor George, thank you for the, taking this, uh, giving us this opportunity to talk with you and, and uh, get a little background about your work and, and um, why you're here and, and uh, the, the, some of the interests that we share. Um, well, thank you, Professor Williams, and uh, I want to say what a great <clears throat> pleasure it is to be at BYU, where so many scholars are doing work that I admire so uh, greatly. It's also fun to be with BYU students who are always so bright and inquisitive and, uh, and interested in learning. It's really a wonderful institution. Well, thank you. We always enjoy your visits. Um, one of the things uh, I th would like to ask about, uh, clearly I think uh, everyone would recognize you as being a, a public personality or mm -hmm. uh, a public intellectual. And uh, so I'm, I'm just curious um, how you have clearly devoted yourself to the life of the mind uh, in, in a serious way. And uh, not everyone can translate that into public expression or mm -hmm. into uh, the, the kinds of forums where people can see it and be influenced by that. How, how, how do you do that? Or what, how, how have you done that over the years? Well, I think it's very important for serious academic work, serious scholarship on the critical issues that we face as a society and as a, and as a nation to be available uh, for use in the public dialogue. I think at its best, good scholarship, at least in these areas, uh, sociology, political science, philosophy, history, uh, the natural sciences sometimes, good scholarship uh, can elevate uh, and inform public debate. But then there is the question of translation. Yes. Uh, there is the question of getting what are sometimes rather abstract concepts, for example, work in philosophy is sometimes very abstract, philosophy being my own field. Mm -hmm. I'll just use that as an example. But um, the general public isn't all that interested in abstract work. No. Uh, most people have other things to do. <laughs> they have jobs and they have kids and uh, they have work to do. And of course the public's not generally trained in philosophy, nor should they uh, uh, be. Philosophy is the vocation for some of us. Other things are the vocation uh, for other people. Uh, but I think it is important that we translate uh, even abstract concepts when they're important into language that ordinary people can understand. And part of my own personal mission or vocation uh, as a scholar uh, has been to do that. I don't know about this term public intellectual. People use it and, and, and people count me in that tribe and that's fine. I have no objection to it. But uh, my concern is that uh, so many public intellectuals seem to be very public and not so intellectual. Uh, and of course, young, uh, young uh, men and women sometimes uh, aspire to be public intellectuals. Yeah. They like the idea of being in the public eye and of uh, uh, engaging in the grand public uh, debates uh, as professors or as scholars. And my advice to young people is this, always put the intellectual first and the public second. Mm -hmm. You cannot be a good public intellectual, someone who really does translate important scholarly insights uh, into language that can be used in the public square. You can't be a first class uh, or even a useful public intellectual unless you are very serious about your own scholarship. So I don't think anybody who aspires to be or who is counted as a public intellectual can afford to just be a public person. Uh, my advice is always be doing serious scholarship. Whatever else you're doing, you may be writing op-eds for the New York Times, you may be appearing at um, public uh, conferences, or you may be involved in political campaigns advising candidates or in referenda or initiative or things like this, but you always need to have a scholarly project going. The day you stop doing scholarly projects and focus exclusively on the public dimensions of the public intellectual life, you are no longer a public intellectual. You're public, yes. You're no longer a true intellectual. At least you're no longer a true scholar. And that means you cannot contribute to the public what, at its best, public intellectuals, or at their best, public intellectuals contribute. As I've had the pleasure of meeting you and working with you and knowing you over the years, um, there's another aspect of your work that I think distinguishes you, that, that it's hard for, for intellectuals to get right sometimes, and that is, uh, you have done your intellectual work in areas that you care deeply about. Mm -hmm. There's a passion there uh, for many intellectuals. I think 
probably not the great ones, uh, but some of the good ones, they, they do it without passion or they, they don't want passion to interfere with their um, intellectual work. But, but there's a certain amount of passion engaged in what you do because you believe it. I just well, uh, yeah, um, I do believe it. <laughs> I only say things that I believe. Uh, except when I'm playing devil's advocate with my students or in a teaching context, where I think it's very important to, to sometimes uh, explore lines of argument that you yourself don't actually buy mm -hmm. in order to see how far they'll go and also to give your students uh, an honest sense of what's to be said against the, the position that I myself uh, might hold because that's really a, a teacher's responsibility. We're not supposed to indoctrinate our students. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to expose them to the best that has been set in thought on competing sides of important issues and then let them, by the exercise of their own reason, make the judgment about where they ought to be. Now, what I admire about the people that you're talking about uh, is the virtue of dispassion because that is a scholarly virtue. Mm -hmm. Scholars need to be able to step back at least a little bit from their subject matter in order to be clear-eyed about it and not let passion or desire or emotion or feeling dictate uh, how the inquiry should go or where it should end up. Because truth really matters. It's the ultimate goal for any academic or scholarly person. And dispassion is a virtue that aids us in the pursuit of truth. So I myself try to be somewhat dispassionate, but I won't pretend to be completely dispassionate because I really do care about uh, the issues that I think and write about and those that I am involved with in, uh, in public disputation. And the reason I care about them is that I think that they are fundamental to our well-being as human beings, to the well-being of families, uh, to the well-being of communities, and really to the well-being of the larger uh, society. So I can't be completely dispassionate about basic constitutional principles, the rule of law, uh, the, uh, the idea of republican government, which I deeply believe in, nor can I be dispassionate about the sanctity of human life, which is so critically important and which is, of course, under attack today in the form of abortion and uh, euthanasia and other evils like that, um, nor can I be dispassionate about the institution of marriage because it's the fundamental unit of society on which the health of every other institution of society vitally depends, nor can I be dispassionate about religious freedom and the rights of conscience. These two are under attack today, uh, not only abroad in many ways that are almost unspeakable, but also here at home, not in quite as violent and vicious ways, but in ways that really do matter. So I do have a certain passion for those issues, but I'll tell you what dispassion requires me to do, and that is to listen to the point of view of people who disagree with me, and not just listen in the sense of hear it. I mean listen in the sense of seriously consider it, <clears throat> consider the possibility that I might in fact be wrong and they might be right. That's the kind of dispassion that even a passionate advocate of say the sanctity of human life or the principles of constitutional republican government ought nevertheless to have. I, th I have uh, always tried to suggest to academics and, and intellectuals but in the academic world where I, where I live and work and you do too that it's important to do something that matters and this is this is what you're talking about mm -hmm. we ought to be engaged in, in something that matters and I found it handy uh, to be my own worst critic or best critic yeah. uh, uh, harshest critic the harshest, harshest critic, critic. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, that, that if I I feel an obligation to make my best arguments against myself um, and that's one way of, of being um, fair and uh, it's very important. We, we really do need to be our toughest uh, uh, critics. Uh, I tell my students that there are really two ways you can get to the conclusions uh, that you'll reach. There are two ways to, to, to determine where you're going to stand on this or that issue. One is to emote your way there. <laughs> just go with your feelings or emotions and usually that will just mean going with the crowd or going with the group mm -hmm. or going with what, what the fashionable people think or what the beautiful people think. So I don't think that's a very good way, but it's one way. And the other way is to think your way to your conclusions. Think your way to the position you will hold. Uh, if you do that, uh, it seems to me you're doing the right thing. Even if you think your way to a position that is different from the one I think my way to, still 
that's good. You're thinking. You're doing the right thing. And I think if we all think as carefully as we can, uh, we will get closer to the right conclusions than if we simply allow ourselves to emote our way uh, into, our, uh, into our position. So our job, I think, as, as teachers is really to encourage our students not to let their emotions and feelings push them around. Don't let trends and fads determine where you're going to stand. Think and have the courage to think and then have the courage to stand up and speak out for the positions you hold on the basis of thinking. And if you're thinking your way, Richard, to these conclusions, then you're going to be doing exactly what you do, and that is being your own toughest critic. You're going to be considering what's to be said for this position and against this position. And even when you've settled on a, on a conclusion, at least provisionally, when you've settled on a conclusion, you're still going to be poking yourself and thinking what is there to be said against this? There is an argument that I hear floating around out there that I really need to seriously consider. Maybe I haven't thought about it before. I need to think it through more carefully. I need to read what some intelligent person who believes that argument has to say in favor of it and so forth. And really, um, would you agree with this? I think a, a good scholar never stops that. I mean, oh, you, that's you, right. never, you never get finished with your that's position. That's why I use the word provisional. <laughs> In a certain sense, all our positions are provisional because we're open to criticism, we're open to thinking, even about the most fundamental things, even about the identity-shaping uh, beliefs that, uh, uh, that, that we have. Uh, now, that's not to say that you shouldn't be a person of conviction. It's certainly not to say that you shouldn't be a person of, of faith, but it means that you should never shut down the process of critical thinking and self-critical uh, thinking. You should never allow yourself to suppose that I am infallible. <laughs> or that I'm finished. <laughs> people, yeah, people who think they're infallible um, first are mistaken because none of us are. Now as a Catholic, I believe in a certain realm, in a certain domain, uh, under certain limited circumstances, subject to certain conditions, the Pope may uh, uh, propound a truth that uh, is already uh, already established, uh, he may propound that it's uh, infallibly uh, proposed, but even on most things, uh, the Pope, from a Catholic point of view, is not uh, infallible, and certainly we're not uh, infallible. So that means that we always have to remember, no matter how strongly we hold a conviction, how dear it is to us, there's always at least a possibility that we could be wrong. So let's keep it open. Now, now let, never let that, though, be an impediment to our going out and acting and standing up for what we believe in. We wouldn't think much of Martin Luther King had he simply held his beliefs but not acted on them, or had he been paralyzed by the possibility that maybe he could be wrong about segregation. <laughs> he wasn't paralyzed. He went out and he acted, and that's what we have to do. We need to do that on marriage and religious liberty and the preservation of constitutional republic and limited uh, government. We need to do that on religious freedom. We need to. Uh, do that on all the uh, issues that are so vital to the future of this uh, uh, society. Let me ask you one related issue. I, I think um, uh, as I've seen you lecture and, and talk uh, in various places and with various audiences around, um, you've always been the consummate gentleman. I, I, I have always tried to follow the idea that uh, ideas really don't deserve any respect, but persons do. <laughs> and yeah. I, so I think in, in conversations, intellectual conversations about these issues, it's important to, to keep that straight. And I, I've watched yeah. you do that over the years. How, how, do you, how do you manage that? You do have harsh critics around. So. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> uh, and I can be sometimes a pretty harsh critic myself, but I do try to keep the criticism focused on the ideas. Uh, and the beliefs, not on the, on the person. Uh, there was an old slogan um, that was sometimes uh, uh, used against uh, the principle of religious liberty, and that old slogan uh, went like this, error has no rights. Well, I suppose that's true, actually. Error, as such, has no rights, but people have rights and people have rights even when they are in error. So when I'm arguing with someone, now by definition, if we're disagreeing, I believe he's in error, he believes I'm in error. We otherwise wouldn't have a dispute. Uh, but uh, even when I believe that my interlocutor is in error, 
I want to respect him as a person and do justice to him as a rational human being who deserves to be treated with respect and with, and with, and with dignity. So I'm opposed to uh, ad hominem argumentation, uh, to uh, uh, trying to uh, ridicule somebody. Uh, that's deeply offensive uh, to me, even when it's practiced uh, on the side of an opinion I happen to hold. It's just uh, intolerable uh, to me. And, and I just wish that this were a more widely held opinion. It seems that not only in our political life where it's very evident that, that, the, that the quality of the discourse has coarsened and degenerated, it's also true, and I, I'm just so sad to say this, Professor Williams, in academic life, you would think that in the academic world people would quite naturally, even when they disagreed, treat each other with dignity and respect, that there would be a kind of uh, uh, esteem for uh, argument itself, since it's the way we proceed toward truth uh, in academic discourse. You would think that those aspects of academic life would lead us to treat each other with civility and respect and dignity, but unfortunately all too often they just don't, and there's an awful lot of incivility uh, in the academic world today. Regrettably, and, and, and I think we just, those of us who are academics need to do everything we can to get it back. We need to set a good example for our fellow academics, and I think we need to, to call people out with civility and respect, but nevertheless, call people out when they break the rules and say, look, you know, you've got you to keep the focus on the argument here. You've gone over the line. You're attacking someone personally. I think also sometimes, at least, we bump into the problem that uh, disagreement is considered to be ipso facto uh, uncivil in yeah. some sense. That's also we've bad. lost we've yeah. lost something. There. Yeah, that's true. Uh, there's an effort to shut down the advocacy of certain perfectly reasonable and responsible positions on the alleged ground that the advocacy of that position in itself is hateful, yeah. or represents animus, or hostility, mm -hmm. or a bare desire to harm other people. This is just a, uh, a, a technique, a tool that's used by people on one side to stifle debate, to shut down the debate. There's nothing more antithetical to the values of academic life than that. Nothing more detrimental to thought itself in a sense. Could, could yeah. you share how it is that you came to the uh, vocation that you have uh, pursued? Oh in uh, intellectual I can, talk, life. I, I can talk a little about that. It was not something that uh, I intended to do when I was uh, uh, a kid or when I was in high school. Uh, in fact, I'm rather surprised, I have to say, that I've ended up uh, uh, in the academic uh, uh, field. Uh, when I was young, I was very interested in politics. And as a high school student, I was involved. Uh, I grew up in West Virginia. I was, uh, in those days, a Democrat. Uh, West Virginia Democrats were a little different from, uh, <laughs> certainly different from Democrats today, so I'm no longer a Democrat. Uh, but in those days, I was a West Virginia Democrat. I was a pretty conservative kind of Democrat, to tell you the truth. Uh, and I was interested in politics. I uh, was involved in Democratic youth activities. Uh, I served two terms as the, as the governor of the West Virginia Democratic Youth Conference, which was the, the, the kids that were too young to be members of the Young Democrats, but were still interested in politics. And I thought that I would probably make my career in law and in politics. I did know I wanted to go to law school, but I uh, aspired to a, a political uh, career. Uh, then I went off to college. I went to Swarthmore, a very intense, intellectually intense uh, uh, college. Um, and in my second year, if I'm recalling correctly, I was taking a basic introductory course to political theory and political theory. And there, our professor uh, had us read one of Plato's dialogues, and it was the dialogue known as the Gorgias. And that dialogue raises the question, why do we engage in discussion and debate, including political discussion and debate? Do we argue for the sake of victory? Do we argue for the sake of social advancement or social standing or being important or being a big shot? Uh, do we argue uh, for the sake of impressing other people so that they will think well of us? What's the whole point? Now, this is a very timely issue for Plato, of course, because in those days, the people known as the sophists uh, were paid large sums of money by the fathers of young men 
to train those young men to be good orators. And that's because your social standing in Athenian society could be very significantly enhanced if you were a good debater, if you were a good orator, if you could speak in the public forum well and persuasively. Now, of course, the sophists were the opponents of Plato's great teacher, Socrates, who appears in Plato's dialogues, including uh, the Gorgias uh, as the critic of the sophists. And Gorgias himself is a sophist. The, the dialogue's named for a sophist. Well, I had never thought much about these issues before, and I was just grabbed by that dialogue. It engaged my mind and my heart in a way that nothing ever had before, and I began to wonder about myself. Because I had been a pretty good orator and a pretty good debater doing all that political stuff when I was in high school. And I had to ask myself, well, what's the point of that? Why am I doing that? Why should we do that? And of course, Plato's answer, very persuasive, turned me around, was that, well, we shouldn't be arguing for the sake of victory, as if it's some sort of a, of a uh, football match or something like that. We shouldn't be arguing for the sake of glory or social standing, enhancing our social standing, or being a big shot or impressing people. The purpose of argument, of dialectic, to use the, the term philosophers use, is to get at the truth, to get at the truth. And so Plato teaches us in that dialogue the person who defeats us in an argument actually is not our enemy, but our friend who has conferred upon us a great gift by showing us where we were wrong, how far we were from the truth. And by realizing that we were wrong, making us realize that we were wrong, that person has conferred upon us the great gift of getting us nearer to the truth. Because truth is ultimately what matters. Truth is intrinsically good. It's intrinsically splendid. It should be what we really want, what we really go after, and that a, that a truly noble life is a life that's dedicated to the pursuit of truth. In this, I was very significantly um, reinforced by the uh, models uh, I had of great teachers who had devoted their lives uh, to, uh, to truth. Uh, two in particular, James Kurth, who was my professor in political science, and Linwood Urban, who was my professor in uh, religion and philosophy. Uh, these, were, these were terrific uh, role models who were living out what Plato was teaching me to love uh, in that uh, dialogue. And that put me on a completely different path, Richard. Uh, instead of a career in politics <laughs> where I would be arguing for victory <laughs> and to get elected, or to get someone else elected, uh, I opted for the, the course of really dedicating my life to truth, to the, pursuit of, to the pursuit of truth. Now, I think that truth is not something that, that we simply contemplate. Uh, we can't, at least I can't live my life purely in the academic domain, trying to find the truth and contemplating the truth as best I can uh, get, a, get, a, get a, a field of sight on it, vision of it. Uh, but rather, uh, the pursuit of truth prompts me to go out into the public square and to advocate uh, for the causes that I believe in because I believe that they are true. I believe in the sanctity of human life in all stages and conditions because I think that it's true that human beings have fundamental, inherent, and equal worth and dignity at all stages in their lives, including the unborn, including the frail elderly. Uh, I'm prompted to go out and argue for marriage because I believe in the truth that marriage is a fundamental human good that is irreplaceable. Uh, and that uh, the marital union is the fundamental unit of society on which the health and well-being of all the other institutions of society uh, vitally depends. And I believe, for example, that religious freedom is just central to the dignity of human beings. I think that's a basic truth, and therefore I don't want to just, just devote my life to the academic defense of mm -hmm. religious freedom. I want to go out there in the, in the public square and, 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 and be a witness to truth, be a witness to the truth about uh, religious freedom. So that's what, that's what led me to the vocation that I have um, pursued. And that witness has to do with our personal lives as well as the quality of our thought and what we, what we advocate. I sure. mean, we, we have to reflect that in some ways. One final question then, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, one could characterize the modern age as uh, being guided in some sense or deeply influenced by a 
deep sense that the question of truth is either insoluble or irrelevant. I mean, the truth does not mm -hmm. show up very often, even in college curricula. We don't, we don't write textbooks to say what's true. We write textbooks on a perspective on a given topic yeah, or something yeah. like that. What, what happens if, if we lose interest in truth or lose confidence that, that there's a truth to be pursued? Uh, everything declines. Uh, first of all, academic institutions decline because they have no reason to exist. Uh, other institutions of society will also decline because they will lose confidence in their own validity, in their own mission. Uh, it'll be anything goes. So I think that uh, uh, societies shouldn't be dogmatic and believe that all the truths are already known and there's nothing to pursue, nothing new to find out. Uh, dogmatism is the enemy of truth. But societies should be willing to stand up for truth as best people can get hold of it, always open to argument and counterargument, and societies should be dedicated to pursuing truth so that their institutions can be more just, uh, serve better the interests of the human beings who constitute those societies. And certainly the academic institutions of any society have to be dedicated to truth. Otherwise, uh, they're pointless and we will have lost for our young people a very, very important value. Um, you know, intellectual uh, historians like to divide up the epochs uh, as the age of this and the age of that. And so, for example, uh, uh, it's typical for intellectual historians to say that the Middle Ages were the age of faith where everything was judged by its conformity to the truths of the Christian religion. The same people tell us that the Enlightenment was the age of reason. So now the standard of all judgment, the standard of good and bad, the standard of true and false, just and unjust, is the standard of rationality. Now those are both oversimplifications. The Middle Ages, uh, think of the philosophers, uh, the great philosophers, people like Thomas Aquinas and Maimonides on the Jewish side, very deeply uh, dedicated to truth as well as to faith because, of course, on the Christian understanding, there's no, there's no tension or, or contrast or contradiction between faith and reason. Rather, they are, they are united. Uh, and uh, the Enlightenment, while it was uh, in a certain sense rationalist, also had many deeply religious figures, even among the leading thinkers uh, of the Enlightenment. But still, there's a certain, there's a certain um, truth in the idea that the Middle Ages were the age of, of faith and the Enlightenment was the age of reason. But to the extent that that's true, the Middle Ages, the age of faith, the Enlightenment, the age of reason, then I would say that our age is the age of feeling. We live in the age of feeling. So now everything is judged according to how it makes us feel. Uh, we, 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 we judge something to be right or wrong, good or bad, just or unjust, not on the basis of faith or not on the basis of reason, but on the basis of feeling. And of course, feeling is very subjective. And so a certain subjectivity, which is self-eroding, which is self-defeating, which will actually undermine its own foundations, creeps in, uh, not only to the thought of intellectuals, but to the, to the general understanding of, of people. So it means that uh, to win an argument, all someone has to say is, well, you're offending my feelings. Or I feel differently, and therefore what you say has no validity. My feelings trump any rational argument you can, you can make. Uh, well, uh, we're not going to do very well, and we're probably not going to last very long, uh, as long as we are the age of feeling. So I think that uh, we need to restore those, uh, those uh, principles of faith and reason, which uh, John Paul II, the great pope, John Paul the Great, now a saint, uh, uh, called the two wings on which the human spirit ascends to contemplation of the truth, faith and reason. And that's such a beautiful metaphor, I think. Uh, anybody who's seen a bird that has a wounded wing realizes that uh, no matter how uh, healthy the bird is otherwise, no matter how good the other wing is, that bird will flap its wing and try to get off the ground, but it'll just go in circles on the ground and never get off the ground because you need both. And I think that's what we need. There's the, there's the cure for what ails us. It's the restoration of faith and reason as the two wings on which the human spirit ascends to the contemplation of truth. As you've been here, uh, you spoke last night on uh, the importance of conjugal marriage, the defense of conjugal marriage. Um, in a few words, could you summarize uh, just why it is that we should consider conjugal marriage important enough 
to defend. Conjugal marriage is just what we used to call marriage. <laughs> right. <laughs> but what we meant by marriage is a conjugal union. That is a, uh, a union of uh, husband and wife founded on the biological sexual complementarity uh, that uh, enables husband and wife under favoring conditions uh, to conceive uh, children that then they then rear uh, together as their own uh, uh, children. Uh, on the conjugal understanding of marriage, uh, the union of spouses is not merely at the emotional or affective level. It's a comprehensive union of spouses. It begins at the biological level made possible by sexual complementarity and that biological sexual complementarity is the foundation and matrix of the overall sharing of life in which husband and wife share their lives at every level of being. Not just the biological, that's foundational, but it's more than that. Also the rational, the emotional or affective, the dispositional, and for religious believers, of course, even the spiritual. Marriage is the conjugal union of husband and wife. Any other idea of so-called marriage will uh, do away with the idea of biological union and treat marriage as a purely emotional bond. Now, if it's purely at the affective or emotional level, then certainly two people of the same sex can be married. They can form a, an emotional connection. They can uh, share a life together based on that emotional connection. They can take responsibility for each other and care for each other. They can engage in mutually agreeable sex play. But by the same token, just as two people of the same sex, as much as two people of opposite sexes can do that, so can three people, or four people, or five people in polyamorous sexual bonds. They can have mutual affection, share a life together, take responsibility for each other, uh, enjoy mutually agreeable uh, sex play. I used uh, in my talk at BYU uh, the example of the thruple, uh, Brindall and Kitten Young, who are a thruple, a three-person uh, marital union in uh, Massachusetts. They'd like to have their marriage uh, recognized. They went through a ceremony with the white gowns and the fathers walking them down the aisle and the whole thing uh, in Massachusetts. But now, of course, they want their union to be uh, recognized. And on the non-conjugal understanding of marriage, the revisionist understanding of marriage that can license so-called same-sex marriage, well then, the young should have their marriage legally recognized, and it's an injustice not to. But of course, I think that's all false. I think that the revisionist conception of marriage as purely an emotional bond is false because marriage is fundamentally rooted in our reality as biological uh, creatures that, among other things, we're not just biological, but among other things, we are biological. And the union that uh, uh, is at the foundation of our marital lives is that biological union that we uh, consummate and renew in our acts of sexual congress, the acts that fulfill the behavioral conditions of procreation, even if the non-behavioral conditions uh, happen not to uh, uh, obtain in any particular case or any, for any particular persons. Now, why is this important to society? Why is it important to society to get the right understanding of marriage, to opt for the conjugal understanding as historically we have, rather than the revisionist understanding of marriage as a purely emotional bond. It's for this reason, Professor Williams. Marriage is the relationship that brings together man and woman as husband and wife to be father and mother to any children born of their union. Providing those children with the inestimable blessing of being brought up in the committed bond the marital love of the two people who's coming together as husband and wife in a biological as well as rational, affective, dispositional relationship gave them life. And additionally and crucially, providing those children, both little boys and little girls, with male and female, not just one, not just the other, but male and female care, role modeling, and affection. Society has a deep and vital interest in marriage understood in that way precisely because of those benefits for children. Society doesn't have any particular interest 
certainly no deep interest in sexual conduct just as sexual conduct. But society has a very deep interest in its own reproduction, in its future citizens, in children. And that's why marriage as the relationship that does bring together man and woman as husband and wife to be mother and father to the children born of those unions, that's why it's so critical to society. Thank you. Um, you also, well, this evening you're going to talk about uh, religious liberty and the defense of religious liberty. Um, briefly, what, what's at stake in religious liberty and uh, why, why is this something that should be part of our public discourse? What's at stake in the debate about re religious liberty is very simple to answer, everything. <laughs> uh, and that's not just because religious liberty is the first freedom in the sense that it's the first liberty stated in the Bill of Rights or that it was at the cradle of the, the larger Western tradition, uh, and particularly Anglo-American tradition of, uh, of liberty. Uh, it's that it is foundational to all the other liberties that we have and to a great many other human goods that we wouldn't uh, conveniently classify uh, as liberties. Uh, the value, for example, of religion itself considered as the asking of the great existential questions, the raising of the questions of meaning and of value. Where did we come from? Where are we going? What's our destiny? What's our calling? Is there a more than merely human source of meaning and value? Is there a transcendent reality? Is there a spiritual uh, realm? Is there a law higher than the human law, the divine law or the natural law, that might call us above our personal self-interest call us to, for example, do unto others as we would have them do unto us, a principle that's, that's articulated not just in Christianity, uh, but in most of the great uh, religious uh, traditions. So there's the asking of those questions, which is vitally important, and which cannot be asked in any serious way in the absence of religious liberty. Then there's the honest effort to answer those questions, to be serious about them, not just to go along with the crowd, but to answer those questions. And then there is the struggle, which for anybody is a lifetime project, of living with authenticity and integrity in light of one's own best judgments about the correct answers to those questions. Now, religious liberty, uh, religious institutions, religious traditions, religious communities provide us with some of the resources for thinking about those questions. Uh, and sometimes our thinking about those questions reinforces our our uh, belief in a particular faith, and sometimes our thinking about those questions, even using resources provided by the faith into which we were born, uh, leads us out of a faith, perhaps into a different faith, or sometimes leads us away from faith. But we still, even if it leads us away from faith, are benefited by being able to be truthful about what we believe, and to live truthfully about what we believe, and to live with authenticity and integrity in light of our own beliefs, and not to live as phonies, people who pretend to be religious when they're not, or pretend to be members of one faith when they're not really, in order to get ahead, uh, to get a better job, or to be part of the in crowd, or for the sake of social standing. Or, as in the old Soviet Union, uh, pretending not to be a believer when secretly you are a believer. A, a violation of our own integrity. So, that good, that deep human good, which has those three dimensions of raising the questions, of answering them honestly, trying to live with authenticity and integrity in light of them, that's a human good for all of us. That's a deep good for all of us. No one who failed to ask those questions or to try to live in conformity and, 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 and honestly with, the, with one's best answers would be living a fully human life, would be living the kind of human life human beings should live. And we can recognize that whether we're believers or atheists. And so whether we're believers or atheists, and quite apart from whatever any particular religion might say or reinforce in this area, just as a matter of reason, we have good reason to honor religious liberty so that people can realize that good. And of course, then there's the social dimension. Religious liberty makes it possible for various traditions of faith to do the great good in the world that they do. Now, would anybody deny that religion has also done evil or that evil has been done in the name of religion? No, nobody would deny that. But think of all the great good that is done by religions, all sorts of different faiths. Uh, when I was here last time, uh, Professor Williams, I was taken around to see some of the uh, social service uh, work 
that the LDS Church does. Absolutely fantastic. Bringing aid and comfort uh, to people who are deeply in need, sometimes people who've been victims of, uh, of natural disasters uh, or other great, uh, uh, great evils. Uh, sometimes people who are just poor and, uh, and, and suffering. And uh, the same is done, of course, by the Catholic Church. I myself am a Catholic and I'm, I'm deeply aware of all the work that's done all over the world for the poor and the suffering and the needy by Catholic charities. Uh, there are Jewish charities. There are the various evangelical Protestant uh, missions throughout the world doing fabulous work for the least and the last and the lost. Uh, none of that can happen without religious liberty. We have a case pending at the Supreme Court, even as you and I are speaking, in which the Little Sisters of the Poor, a Catholic order of nuns, who do tremendous good, caring for people in the most desperate end of life circumstances. These are wonderful women who've devoted their entire lives to caring for very desperately ill and dying people. And the good that they've done is incalculable. And yet our own government is trying to impose on them a mandate that is incompatible with their faith, which if imposed would require them either to violate their consciences, which these sisters will not do, or shut down their work. And who will lose? Those who have benefited and would be benefiting from the great work that the sisters do. So we've got a fight for religious liberty going on, even in this country. Now, what's happening here isn't nearly as bad as what's happening, say, in the Middle East, where the, the, uh, the violations of liberty or uh, religious liberty are truly grotesque. People being martyred, being enslaved, being raped. Uh, nothing like that, thank God, is going on here. And yet, serious violations of religious liberty are going on here. And we've got to oppose those. We have to stand up for religious liberty so that people can be who they really are, so that they can enjoy their dignity as truth seekers, and so that they can go and do the great work for others in civil society that's done by people like the Little Sisters of the Poor. Thank you.